The other day I joked to someone that I had spent the last few months self-isolating with Edwin Morgan, which while that's obviously a joke, when I got the email asking me if I would like to be part of the Second Life program, at that point I only knew Edwin Morgan's name. I didn't know any of his poetry or his scrapbook work or his translations, etc. And so that kicked off a whole bunch of reading and exploring going on dusky evening walks where the world around me felt slightly out of focus because my brain was still half back at the flat on the page with the poem. Morgan's work encompasses such a broad range of styles and content and it was really exciting to read that not knowing at all where it would lead. It's clear from reading Edwin Morgan's work that language was extremely important to him. His work as a translator cannot be separated from his craft as a poet. After reading about how significant translation was to Edwin Morgan's career, I've been considering the importance of translation as an equaliser. It is through language and culture that we are able to share our thoughts, our ideas and our visions for the future. In these times of global uncertainty and limited movement due to the devastating impact of a pandemic, it feels even more important to find ways to bridge the gap, to reach across language and break down those barriers of understanding. And I found his writing fascinating straight away. It's easygoing, it's clever, it's multi-layered. I became particularly interested in his use of language, how he queers or reinvents language, and how he sometimes altogether makes up new languages. Like when he invents a non-human language in the Loch Ness Monster song, a language that we cannot really understand in a poem that is not about nor is it for humans. Or in the computer's first Christmas card, which goes like, Merry, jolly, jolly, merry, merry, holy, holy, berry. He writes this failure of a computer to wish us a Merry Christmas, which is both funny and touching. To see and to read this flawed attempt of a computer to reproduce English. And I think it's also quite political. Doing some research, I found out how Morgan uses these poems to decenter English, to queer it, and to give instead a voice to the non-human, to the Loch Ness Monster, to the people of Mercury, or to a computer. I have a complicated relationship to identity and belonging. My heritage is Zimbabwean. I belong to the largest ethnic group in Zimbabwe, Bashona, or the people of the Mad Zimbabwe culture. As a second generation migrant from an ex-British colony, where English is one of the three major languages spoken, and having lost my mother tongue at an early age, I've had a deep longing to be held in the cradle of belonging that only my own native language will allow. I've been actively reclaiming fragments of Shauna through the naming convention of my photographic work. I have named several pieces with Shauna words, inscribing them with multiple layers of meaning in the process. As a black person living in the liminality of this dual identity, this has been for me an exercise in reinscribing thought, returning to the language that I spoke my first words in to find the truest meaning behind the work. I thought this was a really important area to focus on and taking inspiration from some of Edwin Morgan's playfully written texts such as The First Men of Mercury, a poem that plays with the notion of first contact. For my response to Edwin Morgan's work, I intend to work between Shauna, English, Scots and Gaelic, dynamically moving between these languages, working with translations from Shauna and Gaelic poetry 
including some writings of my own in English. So I thought this would be the perfect opportunity to have this AI play with Edwin Morgan's poetry. I trained it to learn the new centenary collection. Uh, I needed about half an hour to learn it all, which was quite impressive. And then I made it generate its own poems in the style of Edwin Morgan. And the results are quite impressive. I mean, there are occasions when they're really quite terrible. But I think, generally, this algorithm seems to be able to generate quite good, concrete poems. It's terrible at any narrative stuff, it just doesn't get narrative at all, but it is quite good with English. It really doesn't get grammar, but it gets a lot of words right. But I think it's really, really good with sound and with rhythms. And for some reason, in the first test that I did, it became really obsessed with stars. So it made this poem that I became quite fond of, which is called Perry Stars, and goes like this. The starless, the streams and the streets, and starst, the strange of the stars. So you can see already how this, this, this algorithm is quite good at generating Morgan-like concrete and sound poems. And I find it particularly interesting to see how this non-human agent, this non-human creative force can decenter, can queer, can mess up the sort of canon of Edwin Morgan and also the centrality of human speech. The seed of our future is planted within us. Where we go, it follows, feeding on warm African so soil, a warm, inviting reservoir in our bellies, carried in diaspora. The entire world can be our rightful home. I've been reading the new divan and love how each verse is like a vessel containing an exploration of an experience. The descriptions and details are so sumptuous. The poem itself is made up of a hundred verses and it brought to mind like little gems on a necklace or beads on a dustbee, all these vibrant and thoughtful observations connected together. It got me thinking about the details we remember from our own lived experiences. The details that we store away, the details that make a mark on us, I guess it brought to light a creative decision-making that is intuitive and innate in all of us somehow. I spotted in one of Edwin's scrapbooks there was a collage which had the words Landscape of the Heart, which led me to the idea of creating a sort of interior landscape of an experience, one that could be made up of singular elements such as shape, texture, pattern, placement. I imagined these elements as fragments in a space within a loose composition of a landscape. Lattice tingle. Lattice tingle. The air is dark blue. The air is dark blue. Sunlight on your henna. Sunlight on your henna. A sigh to the sea. A sigh to the sea. The piece that I chose, which was Edwin Morgan's A Little Catechism from a Demon, from his small book of poems called Demon from 1999, what really struck me about it was the sort of autobiographical undertones and me feeling like Morgan was talking to himself in a mirror or just talking to himself, period. 
Um, and I kind of felt that narrative and thought of demon as like an internal struggle and less about a figure that's menacing and evil. And so that really inspired me, especially the words, study the demon, study my life, set out now. And they've kind of stuck in my head. I think a lot about quilting and quilting as a ritual. And I think about how it once again needs freeing from the grip of white middle class women and what they call leisure. Um, Because my memory of quilts come from G's Bend. They come from crazy quilts. They come from necessity and trying to keep warm, but still trying to find beauty in poverty. And I think that's where I live in quilting as some form of expression, but also some form of subversion and some form of agency and power in the midst of having none. I'm also thinking about Asafo flags from Ghana and what I really appreciate about them is their use of like patchwork applique. The flags almost look like quilts themselves and like the Haitian loa flags, which shows you like how the African diaspora is so connected even in the most nuanced ways is the animated nature of the applique and like very visual and vibrant and beautiful Um, and symbolism on top of symbolism um, where a whole complex story can be told with just one still on a flag. That one still can mean a whole complex narrative around identity, tradition, resistance, once again, subversion, um, commentary, protest, can mean all of those things in just like one rectangle. And I think that's really important and something I want to kind of invoke in this piece. It's kind of like speaking to the ancestors, but also speaking to the symbolism of my own narrative. On Ling. The scent of early, ripe, soft fruit is unfamiliar among last night's wreckage of bottled chili sauces on the fridge top. He has brought the groceries in before the slow trudge back to a world I now imagine while I work from home, as if work had not gone on at home all the while. The thing I do at home is called love. The thing he does outside, well, that's called work. He has left the fire banked and the porridge oats in a bowl. He has left the creamy white milk ready to be poured. And later, I will point to the strawberries grey with rot and no more English than the pickers were Spanish or I Scottish. But here we all are. And later, his eye will find the few good fruit I overlook. Glasgow is central to Edwin Morgan's work and legacy. In his second life, the city rises around him and in his art, each recharges the other. I moved to Glasgow after high school and lived in halls, like any other student. I wasn't taught about Edwin Morgan as the voice of Glasgow or the voice of Scotland. We'd done Macbeth for O-levels in Cameroon, and that was about it. I'm not sure if this is just something that was highlighted to me because our access to an experience of public space at the moment under such scrutiny. Um, but I kept noticing how much of Edwin Morgan's work came from the physical spaces around him um, and was grounded in, in the people and the places 
in which he existed. So when I began to think about what form a response could take and to think about placing pieces back in these public contexts, placing explicitly queer work in a public context also acknowledges for me that there are parts of um, Morgan's work that I disagree with and or make me uncomfortable, such as parts of his interview with Christopher White, um, Power and Things Not Declared. And so doing this almost feels slightly like a, it's acknowledging it, but it also feels slightly like a challenge to those bits as well. There were no plantations in Glasgow, but all the work of ownership went on there. It was an invisible business. And growing up in a colony, surrounded by plantations that were created by three different European countries, we never spoke about either slavery or colonization. I think it was very complicated. People, it was painful. And so people were reluctant to talk about something that connected where I grew up to Glasgow, where I went later to the Caribbean. And um, people in Glasgow ended up selling equipment that was used in plantations in the Caribbean. Um, and it was just what people did then. Keep coming back to Morgan's own poetry, which is often really incredibly specific, um, specifically placed whether it's Buchanan Street or George Square or his own flat, his own flat balcony, tiny little, you know, six foot by three foot space, um, and yet has this resonance more widely. Um, and so to start my investigations, or part of my early work, was to take the walk from my flat to his flat, um, which I knew where it was from the poem he talks about Bingham's Pond and I knew where Bingham's Pond was because by chance my antenatal classes that I went to um, were at the hotel that's next to Bingham's Pond and even when I was there I was conscious of this is that pond that Morgan's flat looked out on and that sort of way, that sort of classic word of palimpsest, the, the writing over of Morgan's life, his poetry, my life, this new life I have, trundling or carrying a baby around while I think and listen and um, I'd like to explore all of that. There's a lot that Morgan and I have in common, but there's this, the big difference is this, my life as a parent and the fact that my life as a parent has, a, has occurred in a, a heterosexual relationship. So Within the context of Morgan's poetry, I am uh, the sort of definition of um, living a life of safety, security, um, comfort. Um, I'm the one of the women who, you know, has children playing on Glasgow Green and drying my washing, um, and chatting and on my marriage bed, having an, an island and a sea of desire and all of that. And that is not, uh, as you would expect, uh, fully representative of the experience that I'm having of being a mother. Quote, if you think it's easy to be in love, you have misheard, end quote. Even before this current moment, loneliness was on the rise. So love must be important. Friendships are needed in a time of loneliness. Not that friendships have to exclude 
romantic love? Just look at Cathy and Heathcliff in Wuthering Heights. Or Edwin Morgan and his great love, John G. Scott. Um, this is from Lovers No Not Friends by Lord Sorter. Sex in the late hours of the night, the early hours of the morning, amid the debris of a day spent shuffling papers, making lists, sorting references, checking punctuation, correct phrasing, perfect prose. Sex releases my tensions, unaware that it stresses you. You want more than I have to give. The writing comes first. She is a lover and my only friend. Last and most unexpected friend, do you know you overthrew me? Oh, here comes my daughter. I might have to stop. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> Morgan spoke, uh, wrote about it and, and he spoke about it in this sort of famous 1990 interview with Christopher White about how he needed to be alone to write and that meant that he could never live with a partner. So for all the importance of his relationship with John Scott, they never lived together. And in the interview, he talks about how he would need to say to a partner, I need to go for, I need you to go for a week. Um, and that is so far from what I can do uh, as an artist just now. As Jackie Kay puts it, Edwin Morgan could write about anything. And so, of course, he's written about friendship. He's written about love and friendship and complicated relationships. In Love and a Life, he writes about his friend Mark, with whom he was in love, but it was a friendship and not an affair. In those and these, Frank, Jean, Cosgrove, John, Malcolm, Mark, loves of 60 years. Or Jurassic, I have a dinosaur egg in my cupboard, hard, heavy, fused to the rock, it haunts. Someday Mark will have it and tempt its Jurassic chirp with his shazams and taunts. Quote, our love will hold us close as budded leaves, ours is the future we dared not hope to imagine, least of all create, yours is the fire that ignites, the flame sparked from the flint buried beneath this harsh veneer, which is my shield in this hostile world. Come, let us burn Babylon to the ground. Raise the beast, free our souls. End quote. Quote, but in fact, all the love poems I've published are gay. End quote. It was when I began looking for specifically queer readings of Morgan's work that I began to notice that the same few pieces would always come up, these being those that explicitly related to um, love, sexual or romantic identity or experience, which while I can analyse these from a human perspective and a technical perspective, as someone who is queer but very platonically queer, there was a level on which I didn't feel connected. It doesn't feel very controversial to say that Morgan's work is inherently queer, all of it, when you look at the way that he plays with words and subverts the expectations of language, which wasn't something I was expecting, perhaps naively, given his reputation, but it is. I think it's fair to say that the queer community of Scotland at the moment isn't very intergenerational. It's very disconnected and disjointed. And it often feels like 
it can be quite overwhelming to know where to start when trying to begin the process of accessing and learning your own history. And so the process of reading the work of Morgan very quickly became something much broader um, as his work became a jumping off point for queer history and uh, more broadly other aspects of queer theory. Quote, oh I could have tried, end quote. Quote, frolicking and fucking, end quote. Quote, yes I'm condemned out of my own mouth, end quote. 